But today we are focused on what for all of us that is one of the greatest and most rewarding days of our lives. There's a category of students that I'd like to pay a special welcome to today, and that is representative of our online students. Some of whom have come from far and wide to be with us here today. In fact, for the first time, the student class speaker who will be speaking here today is an online student. Our online students have earned higher certificates, degrees, and even qualified as teachers with the BGCE. Some will argue that it takes a higher level of effort. Others will say that the online learning system that Cornerstone offers makes it easier than most other distance programs. Regardless, obviously online learning works for some of you. You are here, graduating. What more evidence do we need? At Cornerstone, we are determined to make online learning work for more and more people as we expand our brand of higher education to reach people across the country, across this beautiful continent of Africa, and in fact, across the globe. Many people still do not have access to university level education, however, because of financial constraints. Today, I want to honor the Golden Families Refuel Education Foundation Trust, the acronym being WEFT, we have made it possible for literally hundreds of students to obtain higher education qualification. Another batch of wave sponsored students graduate from Cornerstone today. Thank you to myself. Goldie who also happened to be Cornerstone Institute's chief benefactor. The value he brings as a leader of this institution is truly immeasurable. We also honor the director of WEF. Tebrenesh, Tebrenesh, if you don't mind standing so people can see who you are. I'd like to honor your presence here today, Tebrenesh. Our students will vouch for the fact that Tebrenesh makes an indelible difference to the success of the fund. Thank you, Tebrenesh. His approach of caring for the person more than caring about the money really works. No wonder the wedding fund can boast a 90% throughput rate while other similar funds have reached 60 million. So well done to them, and thank you again to Mr. Kibler and the Store Absolute. The spirit of giving continued with another family present here today, the Valming family. Professor John Valming, who is not only the president and ceremonial head of our institute, he is also the father of Melissa, who is one of the graduates here today. The Balding family has not only come over to celebrate this achievement, but also to honor their late mother, Angie Balming. Can I ask the Balming family members who are present to stand, including you, Melissa? And you, John. They know you. Everybody knows John. Other family members here? Welcome. Thank you very much for being here. The family has resolved to get the fund out of the starting blocks and have already raised enough money to support two Cornerstone students in 2019. Watch this space for your invitation to the formal launch of this fund early next year, when the first student recipient of the John and Andy Farming Birthday Fund will be announced. Talking about support for our students, before introducing our keynote speaker, I would just like, like to thank Dr. Rudy Bates, our Dean, for the opportunities that he opened up for our students. Just indulge me for a few more minutes as I extend an invitation to all our students to join Dr. Bates and other internationally renowned academic leaders from the Beyond Borders movement. They will be hosting a seminar on the 10th of December entitled Reimagining Re South, Citizenry and Nations. No less than 40 international students will be present and Cornerstone students graduating here today have all been extended a special invitation to be part of this important day of learning, engagement and networking. Dr. Bates will be sending you your invitation on Monday when you are graduate, and I'm really hoping that many of you will be taking up that invitation to be part 
of that very special event that Dr. Bates has pulled together. This let me then get another aspect of Cornerstone's unique way of working, where we are determined to maintain a relationship with our students even after they graduate. Now back to our ceremony and the privilege that has been afforded me to introduce our guest speaker in the table. We epitomize as our team a journey of hope. Berenda David is the Chief Executive Officer of the Community Chair South Africa. He has a career in development spanning some 35 years. He would want me to stop here, but I'm afraid I can't. You do need to know just a little bit more about this esteemed friend of Cornerstone. Berenda is a graduate from the University of the West of Cape. In 2015, he was listed by Professor Jonathan Jansen, former Vice Chancellor of Free State University and our distinguished professor, Professor at Dunbar University, as one of the key voices in development discourses in South Africa today. I know no one else who has made a greater contribution to the development sector in either time than this man. Since 2012, Dorinda has led the community chest, a donor agency which distributed which distributes funding to more than 300 non-profit organizations annually across South Africa. Cornerstone is proudly one of the recipients of funding from the community chest. I will be failing in my beauty, but if I'm telling you just a little bit more about Dorinda. It was at the screening of the Dean Cooties documentary and the life and killing of that Dean, the documentary called Action Commandant, that they deeply moved the Rendo pen up to me and said, no, we have to do more to honor Ashley's memory. That was the beginning of the Ashley Creel Burst Fund, located here at Cornerstone Institute. Supporting students in the one of a kind honored in community development that produced its first graduate of the year. We are proud that, with the support of Community Chase, that we will be introducing you to a further six graduates today. Our relationship with Community Chase is going from strength to strength under Lorenzo's leadership. Expect many more community chairs funded graduates in the future. We are grateful that he has graced us with his presence today, and it is indeed a momentous occasion for me and a deeply significant moment to cornerstone to call on him now to address you. I thank you. Chair of Council, members of Senate, members of the faculty, staff, students and parents, thank you very much for the, the honour to share with you this afternoon very briefly. I know that you are extremely hot and tired and so I will respect that and if you do not of what I speak I will, I will respect that as well. William Butler Yeats wrote that famous poem in 1919 called The Second Coming. And within it he says these, these words, he says, Turning and turning in the wide wing guy, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. The anarchy is, is loosed upon the world. The blood dumped dry is the blood dumped tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. And in those last two lines, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. We are here today to celebrate the achievements of a generation of people um, that many refer to as the generation X's and those who have come through a very tumultuous time in our country's history. We are here to celebrate an achievement that in many cases very few citizens in this country will ever enjoy. Upon you today as graduates are thrust the responsibility and the pleasure of leadership. You've been given the opportunity to bestow again on this country your brilliance, your energy, your moments of intensity, 
to help South Africa become the place that, that we all hope it will become. In 1930, a man by the name of Phil Masterton Smith ran the Comrades Marathon and he came second to a very well-known South African marathon runner called Wally Haywood. Those of you who remember the name Wally Haywood? If you remember him, then you are very old. <laughs> In, 1930, in 1931, Phil Marston Smith ran again, and he lost again, and he came second again to a man called Bill Burry. In 1933, Phil again attempted to run the Comrades, but this time he had no money as he was resident within Cape Town and had no money to go to the uh, Comrades Marathon. And so what he decided to do was he jumped on his bicycle in 1933 and cycled the over 1,700 kilometers to Durban. In fact, it would be Maritzburg that year. And he arrived the day before Comrades. He cycled for 12 days. And when he arrived at about 4 o'clock the afternoon, the next day Comrades started. And he lined up and he ran Comrades that day, the next morning, and he came 10th. 12 days of cycling, over 90 kilometers of running, and he came 10th. But it was, it was Fall's 10th place in Comrades which built his legacy, not his second place. For each year since the last eight years, over 12, for the last, for the last uh, eight years, cyclists have come together from all over the world to repeat that journey leaving very early in the morning from Cape Town, 12 days before Comrades starts, and they cycle down, and I've been there to welcome them, and the next day they all ran Comrades, all 12 of them. And all 12 of them thus far have collected gold medals. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what leadership does. My premise to you this afternoon is, is this, it's not where you are placed which determines your legacy. It's what you achieve despite where you are placed which will determine your legacy. Our legacy today will be the gift we give this country despite where society or history have placed us. It was the American naturalist John Burroughs who in 1911 said these words. He says, jump and the net will appear. And in South Africa today, that's the kind of leadership that is required. People who are willing to step up and risk enough and knowing that at the end of, end of this, the day their sense of validity and value will determine that they survive. In a country that's filled with political turmoil, struggle, poverty, as graduates we must never forget that upon us lies this great responsibility and that is that we must never forget to celebrate the ordinary. We must wake up in the morning and know and understand that our responsibility is to infuse lives with brilliant ordinariness. And what does that look like? That's celebrating teachers, celebrating doctors, nurses, educators, people who clean out garbage, people who ride taxis, <laughs> people who make sure that the door opens for us when we walk through, the security guards at buildings that we begin to understand that in South Africa that the great art of being ordinary begins to grow a great nation. Whilst many of you may have the need to write angry letters to the editor about state capture and the state of the nation, we must continually check, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, graduates, that our own conversion to the paradigm of a new country is secure that we ourselves live the values of the new democracy because it's easy to be angry it's harder to be converted. We must never forget that learning must always be our passion. I urge you, buy newspapers. I know it's uncomfortable. And it's easier to go online and read something. But we must never forget that the culture of buying books and newspapers must never leave us. For in that is one of the cornerstones of what makes a great society. 
We must teach ourselves to value people. You must always remember to ask yourself and others tough questions. We must never be satisfied with the minimalist approach to life except towards materialism. When I was growing up and just about to finish primary school, I was in standard four. I have no idea what grade that is. <laughs> grade six. I was asked to sweep my primary school. School by the name of Heatherdale Primary. And that sweeping the school became a career for me. Because in standard four and standard five, my job was to sweep the school every day. Twenty odd classrooms was the best job I ever had. <coughs> and why does it become great in my later life? It's because those are part, that's part of the architecture, the framework, the memories that builds the leadership that we aspire to. And so as you do things, never forget that you are building with every deed you do. You build your legacy. You build your memory. You fill your mind with the stuff that will determine who you will become one day. But in South Africa today, I ask you that whilst you make learning your passion and you celebrate the ordinary and you value people and you ask yourself tough questions, always keep very close to you the development of a secret greatness. Let your secret greatness always be greater than your public greatness. Let who you are in secret be greater than who you are in public. Do the things which no one else wants to do and don't talk about it. Always in your journeys through life and career, say no to any form of corruption at a personal, employment and at a community level. Say no. And I say to you, you will be sorely tempted. This journey which starts today will tempt you. I say, and I urge you today as you become a graduate of this great institution, to insulate yourself from the corruption that is abounding around us. Understand your obligation to demonstrate practically and visibly your commitment to an inclusive democracy in a very humble way. This is when humility is seen as a strength and not as a weakness. <clears throat> Be willing to do what others will not do because it makes them look weak. Do those things. <clears throat> Make room for everyone. Do, don't exclude or denigrate anyone based on political affiliation, economic, cultural or religious affiliations. Make room in our democracy for everyone in the companies you will build, in the careers that you will build, in the companies you will work in, in the families that you will build one day. Make room for everyone. It's how great countries succeed. And as our democracy grows stronger, we must all refuse to linger in fear and resist reacting to every provocation. We must accept, and you must accept, that fear and anger will be natural responses to the continued intimidation and accusation that lingers in our country. This time in our history, however, requires an extraordinary effort from everyone to rise above the things that anger us and make us sad and to embrace the journeys that will make us great. Wherever you are in leadership, build inclusive leadership structures across the religious, cultural and color lines, no matter how hard and how costly that may be. And here's one that you may not think necessary, but hey, this too, refuse to engage in racist discourses, whether serious or funny. In fact, none of it is funny. Your children are listening to you and they will one day have to go to school with people that you are now talking about. Be aware of how your demeanor can communicate violence towards other people, verbally, physically and structurally. Work at actively minimizing violence in what you say, what you do, and how you behave. <clears throat> Realize and accept that rebuilding a very fragmented and divided country is hard work. And it is hard work. Why, why can't we stop watching television of how bad it is? 
I remember sitting in front of the television with the TRC, and now I have to watch state capture, and it's like reliving all of that drama all over again. And that the building of a democracy of this kind, by young people such as yourselves, will test our patience, our hope and resolve to the limit every single day. And some days you are going to cave in. But listen to me. That is okay. Always just make sure you get up again. Your country needs you. In the journey of building strong countries, I have this advice for you. Become a forgiver. Let me say that again. Become a forgiver. It's the greatest gift you can bestow on other people. To forgive them and to set them free. Be a personal example of living out national forgiveness. Great countries all have great forgivers. The countries who were defeated in the First and Second World Wars, the Vietnams, the War of the 1970s, the Germanys, the Japans, the South Koreas, the Vietnams, the Myanmar's, all those countries today have GDPs and Gini coefficient numbers and poverty levels that are richer and more vibrant than the countries who attacked them. They have economies stronger than the countries who destroyed them. They have more prosperous societies than the countries who attacked them. They are the centers, the centers of innovation today, wherever we go. And when you read some of the research on it, it says that they were willing to do the one thing scientists don't look for. They were willing to forgive. Vietnam just released poverty numbers that show that their poverty levels are, are, are less than the United States. <coughs> and that was a mere 50 years ago. I urge you to build this culture of forgiveness. We cannot go forward in this country unless we find one another. And students, ladies and gentlemen, you, 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 hold part of that key. As far as, as far as it depends on us, on you, fix things and do so joyfully. We live in a society where many people break things, burn things and destroy things. But I urge you to be part of a growing movement of people who will turn back to fix the things that others have broken and burned and to do so humbly and with a deep love for the soil of this land. I hope that you arise as a movement, as a generation who will fix things and not complain about it being broken by others. Let's collaborate instead of hate. Let's include opposites instead of instigating opposition. Let's design strategies instead of destroying properties. Mr. the Irish poet, broadcaster, and later Irish president, Michael D. Higgins, who reminded us all during his inauguration speech in November 2011, uh, when he said this, that our obligation is to be a better version of ourselves. What we give this country must be a better version of ourselves. In every generation we have to make this choice, whether we shrink back to harm to the calling of our fears or whether we become better versions of ourselves. Whether we believe our fears or follow the pathways of the dreamers, the initiators, the inventors and the innovators. For the world we know today was not built on wavering indecision. It was not built on wounded skepticism or war in bravado. It was built on the, on the intelligent ideals of great thinkers who took the concepts of justice and freedom and equality and carefully navigated the pathway that ensured a free, equal and prosperous society that would triumph over the darkness of fear and despair. And boy, did the tools to always find those pathways and more specifically so in times of difficulty, the pathways to a better world and a better us. That obligation to find better pathways using the wisdom of the old 
and the navigational skills of the now to create a better future, now, ladies and gentlemen, rest on your shoulders. It is up to you. We have an obligation in this calling to greatness to not allow others to shrink the world for us, to not join the call for the construction of walls, to not fill people, to not fill cages with people who are like us, but allow ourselves to, to be filled with the wonder we find in each other. And to cause us to believe that we are more and better and greater when we stand as one. This greatness calling, this leadership calling, is a greatness to a global leadership along with your compatriots around the world. I challenge you today to take a walk through the length and breadth of this land and look for ways each day to become a better version of yourself. In 1965, I was in a preschool, one of the first preschools on the Cape Flats. It was run by a man called Dr. Frank Quint. He was the principal of a college called Hewitt Training College. And we were a guinea pig class because he taught people to become teachers at Hewitt Training College. And so he invited us who lived in the neighborhood to come and be the preschool class for his teachers who he taught. And so we sat there in one the 24 of us, my, one of my favorite childhood pictures was my graduation picture in 1965, 66 from that class. But this is what Frank Quinn taught us. Every day we'd walk into the classroom and we were five year olds because at that time we went to school at six. And we were five year olds, and Frank walked into the class every morning, dignified, dressed up as only Frank Wood could be. He lived his whole life in Albemarle Road in Hazendal, and I saw him just before he died to go thank him for what he taught me. But here's what he taught us he would walk into the class every morning and he would say these words, close your eyes. And five year olds love nothing better than that. <laughs> and so we closed our eyes. And then Frank's next words were these. He said, tell me what you see. And all the five-year-olds went, nothing, 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 nothing. And Frank did not stop at nothing. For about two months he did that every morning. Close your eyes. Tell me what you see. And suddenly five-year-olds began to see stars fish swimming, their mother's face, sandpits, wiggly worms, and the imagination was just set alight. Frank went toward five-year-olds to see in the dark. The greatest gift an educator can ever give any child. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been taught to see in the dark. May you amaze us with what you see. of some very special and inspiring young women and men <laughs> who have gone out of their way to look stunningly beautiful today. Um, I am head of student services and so I got to spend some time with quite a lot of your loved ones, people that you love and that you've um, stood behind and supported. Um, so today I just want to encourage this group, this particular group of graduates. Um, this is your day. Yeah, it's your day. And so we, we celebrate this achievement with you. It's not been easy, but you pushed through. And here you are looking all amazing, hair blown, makeup, looking all just beautiful. But you know, it's not just that outer part of 
you that is beautiful and that's amazing. You are amazing because of what you've achieved. And you're not only amazing, you are of so much worth to your families, your friends, and also to the people out there that you are going to impact. Stephen Covey says, something worth, he says something worth about remembering. He says, what you do has far greater impact than what you say. So you can say a whole lot of things. It's easy to speak, but when it comes to doing it, that is where the impact lies. Wherever you may find yourself, let the people around you be impacted not only by the knowledge or skills you have gained, but by your character, and especially by your heart. Those values we told you about at orientation, do you remember them? Remember them? <laughs> Did you know we had values? <laughs> I want you to take them with you. Every time our campus students came into this building, there were values on the wall. And occasionally, in some of our conversations, we tried to discuss those values so that you can live up those character traits. So I'm going to go, I'm briefly going to go through them. The first one is integrity. Be men and women of integrity. And then respect everyone you interact with. Even when things get a little hectic and you feel you are misunderstood, be respectful. It will be difficult for unity to exist if there isn't respect. So we've looked at integrity, respect, and unity, the first three of our core values. You will find that unity is prevalent where healthy contentions and discussions are respectfully spoken through. Now also, make your life beautiful by bringing your own creativity to every aspect of it. Anthony Robbins says that the secret of unleashing your true power is setting goals that are exciting enough that will truly inspire your creativity and ignite your passion. The last core value you would have seen up on the board is, if you did see it, is excellence. Um, always do what you do in the best way possible. Don't take shortcuts that will, could cost you your job or your life. We have walked this journey together as partners. We laughed. Some of us cried on the blue couch. We've had some really deep and at times uncomfortable conversations. And we look hilarious when acting like clowns in pajamas on pajama day. Some of us may have interacted only through formal meetings or greetings or via email. All of those interactions, no matter what they were, have been so important. You may wonder why I would think that that's important. I say that because those interactions are cornerstone connectors. Interactions that are linked to a specific institution. Not only linked to classmates, the staff and the faculty, but linked to an institution and what it stands for and what it believes in. These cornerstone connectors meshed with integrity, respect, unity, Creativity, inclusivity, and excellence leave us all with a gift. That gift is a collage of rich memories, sculptured into something beautiful, embedded in the crevices of our minds and our hearts. Take those cornerstone connectors with you as you continue on your journey as cornerstone alumni. And if you don't remember anything I have said, remember this. Never lose hope during seemingly hopeless situations that may arise as you wait for a job or when the journey gets tough and then always, always, always try to make every moment count because life is so short. In a few moments from now, this moment will be a memory, a sweet memory, one of many you will collect and that you can go back to because memories like these give you hope. And it is memories like these that might be the reason you continue in pursuit of other dreams and goals when you actually feel like giving up. 
So, congratulations to the class of 2018. We are so proud of you. gentlemen, our president, the members of the board, our CEO, the staff and faculty of Cornerstone and the graduating class of 2018. What an honor it is to speak on behalf of the graduating class of 2018 at this auspicious event. The book of Psalms 118 verses 23 to 24 reads, this was the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made and we be glad in it. Amen. Today, after three years, and perhaps more or less for some, of soldiering on, of plowing through, obstacle after obstacle, we have reached the end. While most of us were campus students, a few of us here today were quite fortunate to have been amongst the online cohorts, which in itself presented numerous challenges. While our our campus students sat in classes with the lecturer. Some of us simply had to grasp the concept of the virtual classroom setting, and that was a challenge. You might agree with me that it was not always easy being disciplined enough to submit our assignments on time in order not to lose the 3% per day. <laughs> Other challenges included managing our time efficiently, while dedicating several hours per day to ensure that we kept on top of the modules. And the biggest challenge of all, completing that senior project paper. <laughs> In fact, while working on the paper, I received messages from some of my classmates. And I won't mention any names since they are sitting right here and may harm me if I mention them. <laughs> like this message, for example. Hi, friend. Just wondering how you're feeling about the SPP draft submission today. I think I've actually got an ulcer. <laughs> and another one asked me, hey, are you still alive? <laughs> and that's it. That was the end of the message. <laughs> when I replied, what do you mean? The response was, after that SPP knockout. <laughs> As you can see, yes, we are alive, barely. And in the final days of completing my senior project paper, and as I desperately clutched on straws, I lashed out at a family member who had walked this path we were on. I sent her a message reading, you should have warned me earlier about what a Dawn SPP entails. I didn't mention Dawn, but let's just say I did. She told me to please not be overwhelmed and ended a message with, you will make it through, albeit inelegantly, but you will. <laughs> After having had some time to clean ourselves up, here we are. We did make it through and looking rather elegant, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> I firmly believe that were it not for the support of the Cornerstone family, some of us would not be here today. Therefore, on behalf of the class of 2018, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to Cornerstone Institute for depicting what a truly phenomenal tertiary institution should be like. There are three exceptional characteristics that I think most of us will agree that Cornerstone exemplifies. Firstly, Cornerstone faculty members have real love for their students. You can feel that they genuinely want us to succeed on this journey and beyond. However, that's not to say that they were overly lenient. We lost grades, well I did, <laughs> when we were meant to, and yet we were rebuked with love, and then encouraged to go back to our lessons in order to understand the contents. Secondly, Cornerstone provides a platform for genuine connections to be formed between the students and the faculty members. For online students, this was evident on our WhatsApp groups and on Facebook. For campus students, I'm sure those connections happen in classes or in the college hallways. I recall once in my second year, in my second year, when I was struggling financially, and as some of you might have also experienced the same difficulties, I requested prayers. 
and received an overwhelming response. I can't think of any tertiary institution that embodies that meaning of we are our brother's keepers. From the perspective of an online student, I would like to say that the online lectures have a way of making you feel as though you are in close proximity, even though there are hundreds or even thousands of kilometers away. Some even went above and beyond when I know it was their call of duty by calling and sending us WhatsApp messages to remind us to submit those assignments on time in order not to lose the grades. In conclusion, I would like to congratulate my fellow class of 2018 for making this far. We have run our race, we have finished our course. And I want to encourage those currently on this journey or for those looking to begin this journey by saying, go for it. It is worth it in the end. Because the end is in fact the beginning. The beginning of our various callings. We may be called to be sociologists or community development experts. Today we can confidently say that we are ready. Your calling may be to be a counselor, or start a business, or work in ministry, or even education. We are ready to change this world. Because here in Cornerstone, we have learned to change the world. So don't listen to those telling you that you can't do it, including yourself, because you can do it. You will do it. Cornerstone class of 2018, we have done it. qualification of people who's here, and then we have an announcement of in absentia that's awarded. And so when I get to the in absentia candidates, you don't have to chat, you know, I'll just read through the names, and at the end of it, welcome to chat for them as well. So but please don't feel in any way you're really welcome to chat and congratulate and so forth. So um, our first student in actual fact is uh, Melissa Lucia uh, Balmy, which is, you know, who is Professor Balmy's daughter. So before I get the process going, just to announce that, and that's why the reader slides at the moment not there, and Professor Balmy will do the first disqualification. So, Madam Minister and the President, I present to you the following candidates who have successfully completed the program requirements and have fulfilled all the conditions as accepted by the Board of Directors the academic office, our accrediting bodies, and the Senate, which now enables the candidates to be awarded the following certificates. High certificate in business studies. <coughs> Melissa Sinai Lucia Bowman. Demetria Aquel Inacio.
can it be fruitful? Chamiso Rusvito. James Keith Sr. and Josiah Smith. The highest significant in Christian ministry. Esther Mikaela by Sidon, but before you move on, actually um, herself and her mother are also graduating today. <laughs> Give you a proper hand. Yeah. So, I'll come around a bit later for the, for the VA psychology, but uh, you are welcome. There we go. Uh, Esther, Mikaela, Vinsayman. <laughs> the highest certificate in community counseling. Arthur Edgar Johnston. Shabisile <laughs> Teodora Sitole with distinction and top student in the program. Certificate in Education, Intermediate Phase Teaching. <coughs> Kelly Conradi, with distinction and the top student in the program. <laughs>
smart than Gilbert Julius, but before we go, um, it's also a uh, 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 husband and wife. Yes, husband and wife over here. Right. They still can't go together across the state. <laughs> Marvin and Gilbert Julius. Gabriela of 
Sofia Guante. And in absentia, Cameron Lee Bainley with distinction, Leant Wofford with distinction, Adele Josephine Johnson Goddard, Shambhane Yuban, Ruth Abigail Kinsman, Gemma Leonard, Kevin Lehman Murray with distinction, Vijaya Lakshmi, Gengen Naidu, Kaliso Mateonoro Namuchana with distinction, Martha Anana Nyamani, Shereen Finan, Lauren Prince, Lindsay Scott, Peter Hayden Stewart with distinction, Salwovich Stein with distinction, Lorraine van der Reis, and Anayin van Barmeke, van Barmeke's character. <laughs> Mr. President, I now request you to confer the BA, the Bachelor of Arts, upon the following candidates who have successfully completed the program, requirements, and have fulfilled all the conditions on this qualification. Tanya Nicole Adams. I confer upon you the degree Bachelor of Arts. Thank you, Lord. 
one started. Emily Jane Williams. with distinction and the top student in the program. <laughs> Stella Darby, Antoinette Claire Dupassi, Daniel Brunt Forum, Candice Diane, Diane Wall, Candice Lee Rousseau Petzer, Anya Jo Sultis, Estelle Eudora van Eden, and Timothy Berhey. President, I now request you to confer the Bachelor of Theology in Community Leadership degree upon the following candidates who have successfully completed the program requirements and have fulfilled all the conditions of this qualification. <coughs> Bachelor of Theology in Community Leadership, James Bishop, Bishop Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> the Kita J. Wither with distinction. Bachelor of Theology. And then our of this year, SRC President. And with distinction, and top student in the program, congratulations, Kendall Adelaide Bindros. confer the Bachelor of Arts Honours in Community Development upon the following candidates who have successfully completed the program requirements and has fulfilled all the conditions of this qualification. <laughs> Carlos Ernest Tileje. <laughs> 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 
and conferred upon you the degree Bachelor of Arts Honours in Community upon the following candidates who have successfully completed the program requirements and have fulfilled all the conditions of this qualification. <laughs> Jennifer Blair Armstrong. I'm going to go to the degree Bachelor of Arts, Honours in Psychology at the <laughs> Bianca Boyson and with distinction. Thank 
Germain, Shamula Derija, Christian.
and to the boss. Even Sarah? Wow. Wow. Sumbu Shabi. Zinzishwa Sundaba. Amanda Gail Kaneman Andreas and John Van Dyke with distinction. <laughs> Mr. President, and I request you to confer for the first time the Bachelor of Arts Honours in Psychology, be Psych Equivalent. We are very proud of that. Upon the following candidates who have successfully completed the program requirements and have fulfilled all the conditions of this project. Sondre, Cresana, Adams and with distinction. I confer upon you the degree Bachelor of Arts, Honours in Psychology, Insight. <laughs> Salamina Apane. Thank 
Jan Gerbrand Duplessis. Sharon Gunston and with distinction. Devon Luke Poole with distinction. Rebecca Louise Jones and with distinction. Lorenza Lauscher.
Nina, Johanna, Weissen, Distinction and the top student in the program. In order to be eligible for this award, a student must have completed a qualification in a maximum of one year more than the minimum amount of the time required for the program. An award is presented in the bachelor's category and in the postgraduate category. Now, no one knows this yet, so this is news to everyone. Bachelor qualification. Our former SRC president, Kendall Adelaide Bindler. <laughs> Kendall had completed the Bachelor's in Community Leadership, the Bachelor of Theology in Community Leadership. Congratulations. Graduate qualification is for one of our students in the, in the BA Honours in Psychology, Ziyar Mahadi. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've been asked to hand over the 2018 Lincoln Sport Arts Award. Uh, the purpose of this award is to recognize a graduating student who has overcome unusual and extenuating circumstances. Against all odds, the student was determined to reach his or her goal. In spite of these obstacles, has remained at Cornerstone, maintaining the past grades and successfully completing the requirements of their program of study. The criteria for this award are, one, courage and determination, integrity, good standing in the Cornerstone community. So it's my distinct honor to say that the 2018 Against All Honor Award goes to Bramwell Last <laughs> So, uh, just before I uh, read out the citation for the President's Award, I can see that uh, all the fans are going, we've used up all the oxygen in the room. So, uh, we are coming to the end, and I thank you for blowing some of that air towards me while I was sitting there. I literally had just gotten off a flight from, from Tokyo. Uh, I didn't see my daughter or even my children until I got here. So um, I um, spent several hours in Hong Kong as well. So I just wanted to say when I congratulated uh, our guest speaker Lorenzo Davis uh, on his excellent speech, I said I didn't know that we both went to the same primary school. <laughs> so, I also went to heaven, uh, but they didn't make me sweep the classrooms. <laughs> what they did, well, I went to the next door school, and they made me do that there. So, they made me clean the classrooms every single afternoon. And so, I decided I'm leaving the school, <laughs> and I matriculate at Alexander Sinton. So, that's where I went. That's where my son was holding. And, you see, this is, a, this is a Alexander Sinton Murphy. <laughs> I, um, I just want to say to the students, there's something very inspirational about being here and about being at the graduation ceremony. And I just want to say that whenever I see someone setting out to achieve the goal that they aspired to, that, that encourages me. But I just want to leave one Bible verse with you. And that's something that I remind myself every day, uh, every morning. And that is, what does God expect of you? What does God expect of me? Three things. To act justly. That's in Micah chapter 6. To love mercy. You have to be merciful to love it. And to walk humbly before you. That's so difficult to remember when God really thinks it's important, He only gives us three things. So may that guide you as you leave from here. The President's Award for 2018. <laughs> A candidate for the President's Award is judged by the faculty, staff, and students as a student who best represents the core values of Cornerstone. While it is recognized, that this candidate might not be the student with the highest academic standing, it must nevertheless be the case that he or she possesses all the qualities that we celebrate as an institute. To this end, the President's Award will be given to a final year student who has shown consistency of character, is actively involved in the community, is supportive of fellow students, has demonstrated academic excellence and the potential for further learning, and who is spiritually, socially, 
and academically well-rounded. So it's my pleasure to announce the recipient of the President's Award for 2018 as a, as a student with the highest academic standing and the highest achievement of the qualities that I've just mentioned. This year's President's Award goes to Kendall Byron. <laughs> And in the series is there by the sounding. It's hundred and it's <laughs>
10 o'clock in making this day has been, has, has been and will continue to be. So firstly, we want to say thank you to the Chairman of the Board, Marcel Golding, along with the Board members of Cornerstone Institute, who gives the direction and for honouring the graduates with their presence today. We also want to thank the management, staff and faculty of Cornerstone for the role that they played over the past few years in ensuring that the graduates reach their goals. To Lorenzo Davids, we are grateful for your speech today, which speaks to our vision of enhancing and advancing human dignity and social justice for all. Just as a token of our appreciation, we would like to give you a gift. Basil Snayer, thank you for playing um, for us for the third year in a row. We are so grateful. To James Benji, thank you for taking our ceremony to another level through your rendition of your song. To Jerome and the Bay for the sound, we thank you. To those who assisted, assisted in the preparation today, we don't know how to thank you enough. It's been a long couple of months preparing. Thank you to the staff who is working today. We appreciate you so much. Then, there is a group of people, and I've been asked that we do something really special for this group of people. So, the graduates, we would like you to stand for this group of people with your tube in your hand. This group of people, we're just going to stand before I go on. So this is the group of people who have walked alongside our graduates and who were there for them when they were sleep deprived, were miserable because of stress and did not eat at all. These are the people who had to see to the accounts and the transport and the food and the roof over their heads. And these are the parents, the husbands, the wives, the grandparents, the friends, the children of the graduates. So, I would like you graduates to lift your tube and for the rest of us to give a hand to these special people. because it's going to be very hot in the building, so we want to get out as soon as possible. Thank you so much. I am Paolo Cristalini. I hereby dissolve this gathering. It's gathering for this conference. 